Imagine it's 1833 and you're standing on the first tee at St. Andrews with a crowd gathered around for, uh, for the September annual meeting of golfers. Hugh Phillips uh, orchestrating all the foursomes. Ballmaker Davey Robertson, who's Alan Robertson's father, is schmoozing with the members and he's also helping with the handicapping. Uh, approaching the first tee is John White Melville. And he's a former captain, very well known. And he's about to hit the ball and his caddy tees it up, the feathery ball. And just then his hat blows off because there's a lot of wind blowing in his face. So he decides to change course. His caddy gets the hat, his opponent tees off, uh, and he watches his opponent's ball fly pretty well in the beginning, but that wind just picks up the ball. Ball goes almost vertically and even comes backwards a little bit and only goes 50, 70 yards, something like that. So at that point, uh, White Melville decides to grab, tells his caddy, grab my driving putter. So you say to yourself, what the heck is a driving putter? So a driving putter is a club that looks like a play club and a putter. It's a hybrid between the two. It's got the loft of a play club, about 11 degrees. It's got the shape of a putter, typically. It's got the length of a middle spoon. And um, it's meant to be used for shots against the wind. And also, it's meant to be used as a, a putter for when you're hitting through the fringe or or higher grass around the green. Remember, their greens were pretty crude back then, so you needed something pretty lofted to get you going. The reason I mentioned 1833 is, uh, let's see, George Fullerton Carnegie, or Carnegie, uh, he delivered a speech to the uh, St. Andrews golfers of that year at their annual dinner, and he uh, said uh, the following in, in a poem. This is an excerpt. There to the left I see Mount Melville stand, Erect his driving putter in his hand. It is a club he cannot leave behind. It works the balls so well against the wind. So that was the first mention of a driving putter. And you'll see mentions later uh, in the uh, throughout the 1800s, through the uh, feathery era and the gutta percha era, um, there was a mention. Uh, Alan Robertson mentioned about mentioned it, saying it's uh, cheating the wind. The the balls just skim. And the ball tends to fly like a. A swallow and just tip it, uh, dancing on the tips of the blades of grass. Um, so there are various mentions and I looked at the characteristics of what was mentioned. There were probably, I found like a dozen different um, descriptions of this club and it wasn't homogeneous. Some said there was the flexibility of the play club. Some said it should be as stiff as a putter. Some said the height of the face should be much higher than a putter. Others said it should be the height of a putter. So it's extremely variable. So I, I have fooled around trying to make this, uh, hit this driving putter, and I have not had much success with it. The, I guess the whole point is you're not getting it airborne. You're just hitting a squirrel chaser, or a line drive, pretty much. Um, but I'll see, I'll, I'll see if I can get one at least a little bit airborne. So we'll give it a go and see. I'm going to use a gutta percha ball with this and see if I can get any luck with it. I, I tried a few times and just hitting a lot of grounders. I want to see if I could just get it going a little further. I think it's it's fine if it um, if you're playing on a very firm turf like uh, Musselboro in the summer. Um, you might be able to roll one 120 yards or something against the wind, which isn't too bad with these modern replica gutta percha balls if you got a lot of wind.